Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wadier. And I'm Tommy Welling, and you're listening to the Fasting for Life podcast. This podcast is about using fasting as a tool to regain your health, achieve ultimate wellness, and live the life you truly deserve. Each episode is a short conversation on a single topic with immediate actionable steps. We cover everything from fat loss and health and wellness to the science of lifestyle design. We started Fasting for Life because of how fasting has transformed our lives, and we hope to share the tools that we have learned along the way. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Fasting for Life podcast. My name is Dr. Scott Wadier, and I am here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Tommy Welling. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Hey, doing well, Scott. How are you? Awesome. I am incredibly excited about to today about today's episode. Um, we're going to look at some research, but we're going to have a very uh, real life application and a little bit of anecdotal conversation around um, the changes that we're seeing as a whole in this country when it comes to health and nutrition and weight and all of those different types of things, but some really cool metal analysis. Um, and we're going to give you one simple action step that could transform your fasting journey. If you're new to fasting, if you've been fasting and you've hit a plateau, or if you're dreading thinking that you've got that last five or 10 pounds to lose and it's time to get on the biggest loser and go hardcore workout seven days a week, we are going to, we are going to break it down for you and give you one main action step here um, at the end of the episode. And I think it's going to be really cool because it, uh, it really talks or speaks to half of the equation in, in our in, in um, the one of the most uh, accepted kind of thought processes in terms of building health that you need to eat right and exercise. And that's kind of where it falls apart for a lot of people. So let's break it down. Let's get into it. Uh, and I am excited. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Um, and, you know, eating right and exercising, putting those two things together. We, so often we can get our, our goals kind of mixed up within, within those things too. So, you know, keeping um, keeping our, our ability to actually, um, take actionable steps, simple, actionable things that we can do every day. And also getting away from some of the perfectionism, uh, that we see too, which means we can take small steps every day and have a significant, um, improvement on our, on our health and our insulin levels and overall results. Right. Yeah. And one of the cool things about this is this is, this study was looking at, um, this is a meta-analysis. So it was a big study, and it was looking at a class of people that aren't typically studied when it comes to blood sugar-related conditions. A lot of the research that's out there is looking at the diabetic community, type 1, type 2, pre-diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, syndrome X, all of those different types of things. And I really like the fact that uh, the study was the effect of a single bout of continuous aerobic exercise on glucose, insulin, and glucagon concentrations compared to resting conditions in healthy adults, which this is also a systemic review, meta-analysis and meta-regression. So you're talking like one of the higher level, um, you know, we can take some pretty cool things away from this study. It's not limited. It's got a broad scope. And it was done recently, uh, you know, just published in April 27th of 2021 in the Journal in Sports Medicine. Right. Uh, sport done medicine. at, <clears throat> yeah, sport like, leading cutting edge sports, like, mm -hmm. like not, not old school, like dogma thought process, like new, like at the Imperial college of London, like yeah. looking at this new category of what we're looking at is like called metabolic health. Um, and it really had some cool outcomes in terms of not necessarily like specifics. We saw a 30% decrease. We'll talk about a, a, a second study that kind of overlaps this in terms of sugary drinks and consumption in the U S. Um, but really like looking at this, we've, and we've talked about this in the past, Tommy, this 10,000 steps to nowhere, like these Fitbit yeah. trackers and these, mm -hmm. you know, get your 10,000 steps in. And when we did that episode, it was pretty eye opening to know that there's really no science that shows 10,000 is the key. It's like 4,500 to six to 7,000. If my memory serves me correctly, depending on the age group and the activity level. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about like one thing you can simply do. And the cool thing was, this was really like a look at prevention because the diabetes epidemic, the blood sugar epidemic in the US, but also worldwide is growing exponentially. It is growing incredibly fast. And we can talk about all the different things, the food supply and, and the sugar and the, you know, all of those ins and outs and struggle points for people, the convenience of food. But 
Um, this was one of the few that we've seen at this size um, that really said, hey, uh, let's look at the people that don't have the condition yet that we're trying to treat mm-hmm. and see what we can do to give them things so they never end up in a position where you're now on insulin, taking diabetes medications, worried about making it into retirement. Right. And unfortunately, that population is getting harder and harder to find. The research studies are having to, they're having to go to greater extents and, you know, pay participants more to find that smaller group uh, of healthy individuals who don't have any blood sugar related issues. And, and that's unfortunate, but, you know, when we see results like these, they're encouraging that we don't have to do, um, we don't have to be perfect in, in everything. And we don't have to go through um, exorbitant lengths to, to, you know, reduce our, our blood sugar and our insulin spikes. And, you know, this, this study, um, as soon as we saw it, it, it reminded me of just that, that kind of old school, anecdotal, um, you know, recommendation that you might get from, from an older aunt or uncle, from grandma, or grandparents. Yeah. Grandparents, just like from great aunt Susie. You're like, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. After dinner, just go take a walk. Right. Like, like that's just kind of a, a natural thing that you, you see some people do and, and the people who do it, it, typically that's been, that's been a habit over, over a lifetime that's kind of passed down within the family, but there's some, some really cool physiological benefits of, of controlling the insulin spikes clearing out some of the blood sugar and, and reducing the, the body's need to, to shoot out so much insulin to, to handle, um, to handle the, the previous meal. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the main thing here that we're trying to, to get after and, and control and, and have a benefit for. Yeah. So the study, a couple specifics here, the study looked at a single bout of continuous cardio for more than 30 minutes and its impact on glucose regulation or blood sugar and other hormones like insulin and glucagon that influence the long-term metabolic health of an individual, right? So the exercise exercise had to be at least 30 minutes at a fixed intensity, and they did it either on a treadmill, walking or running, or on a cycle, um, or on a bike where they were able to measure it. And the paper looked at 51 studies that were similar. So a massive... Um, kind of aggregation. Yeah. yeah. And of all the data and what they, what the, the unique point one more time is that these people were not diagnosed with a metabolic condition where the outcome of this study, it's not apples to apples, but we had talked previously about an exercise um, study that was done in uh, people that had blood sugar related problems. And they compared one single 30 minute bout of walking compared to a minute and 40 second bouts of walking that totaled up to 30 minutes throughout the day. Yeah. And what they found was the minute and 40 was more effective. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit different where it's now looking at people that don't have, these are the people that um, may have the risk of developing type uh, two diabetes. And it was cool because it didn't just look at the downstream effect, which is the glucose. People say, Oh, I have a blood sugar problem, right? Okay. Well, if you manage Mm -hmm. the blood sugar, then that's like putting a piece of tape over your check engine light when it comes on in your car or going to AutoZone and having them clear out the signals. You're like, nah, I'm good. You're looking at the downstream effect, right? So the cool thing about this is it also looked at insulin and glucagon. So insulin is the hormone that um, governs fat storage. And it's, um, it also um, is, is raised when you ingest food to help process the, uh, the blood sugar that is, that is created from the ingestion of calories and food. And then glucagon, which is the messenger <clears throat> that tells glycogen or stored energy to be turned into glucose so the body can use it. So I like that it was looking at two of the main players in the upstream um, you know, process of how to manage metabolic conditions and blood sugar related issues. Um, rather than just looking at the end result, which is the glucose. Yeah, doing any sort of this steady state um, exercise or cardio activity uh, within up to six hours of eating, of actually breaking our fast and eating, significantly decreased both of those things. Glucose and insulin levels all went down um, more versus the, the resting state, kind of the whole like oh, well, I just ate. So, you know, let me just kind of hang out on the couch. I'm feeling a little lethargic, especially as we have, uh, if we have a a bigger meal, think of Thanksgiving, where that's a huge insulin spike, and you feel like super lethargic after that. Well, you know, kind of fighting that urge to just kind of get sedentary, and instead just walking or 
moving for a little while is going to, you know, force the, the sugar out of the bloodstream. It's going to force the, um, the body to not have to, 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 um, produce as much uh, of an insulin spike, um, because the muscles are going to need to actually start contracting, start absorbing some of that blood sugar. And, um, it, it puts a much, much, uh, reduced lower, uh, stress on the body. It, it's cool because the, so you guys might be thinking like, all right, that's a lot of words. What does this mean for me? Glucose homeostasis, like balance. Homeostasis means balance. The body always wants to be in balance. It has a checks and balances system. It always wants to be in balance. Two sides of the immune system, the adaptive and the innate, those want to be in balance for a healthy ecosystem, right? So mm-hmm. homeostasis means balance. Glucose, this is from the author of the paper. Glucose homeostasis is a very strong and important risk factor for disease progression over the long term, especially in these metabolic type. Uh, lifestyle induced type conditions. So there was some hypothesis here on, you know, what they would expect to happen. And it was interesting because um, they found that doing any cardio, regardless of intensity within six hours, right? So Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be exactly walking, but it could be, you like you said, just getting up and getting off of the couch. If you're not, if you're new to exercising, right? Sure. Um, But there was no significant change in the blood sugar or insulin when exercising in a fasted state. So to make sure we're clear here, we're not saying that this is exercising after a meal in a non-fasted state is better than, has better health, long-term metabolic positive effects than when you exercise in a fasted state. There is many, 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 many articles that show that exercising in a fasted state has benefits. What we're looking at mm-hmm. here is how do we accelerate the healing process? How do we increase the preventative process of using fasting in our day-to-day life? Well, you fast, <clears throat> you eat intentionally, right? Mm-hmm. You don't rely on the convenient fast foods and all of those things, right? You have those meals planned for your enjoyment, the meals that you love, the family dinners, the, the holidays, the special occasions. Sure. So you fast, you stick to your window, you break your fast, you eat intentionally. And then when you're done eating, get up and go for a 30 minute walk. And now this study showed you only have to do it three times a week and it has drastic improvement or an improved effect on your blood sugar. Yeah, that's fantastic because, you know, while we're fasting, one of the biggest benefits and one of the the main reasons why, you know, we, we fast and we're, and and fasting is a lifestyle, even if the fast is, is relatively shorter is because of that control over the insulin levels. Um, Insulin, you know, getting out of control and staying high for too long is exactly what gets us into the place of being overweight and on our way to prediabetes and the cardio metabolic risks and, and everything else that we talk about. So if we can, if we can keep the insulin levels low while we're fasting, then eating intentionally, avoiding, a, you know, undue insulin spikes or, or getting it too high then. And then even on the back end, after we're, we're done consuming that meal, um, you know, implementing the, the exercise or the walk, um, so that we can even bring those levels back down more quickly, um, and, and have less of an insulin stress on the body. I mean, now, now you're talking about having all of the pieces of the puzzle. I mean, you're, you're sharpening all the tools in your tool belt right there for control. And I want to juxtapose this to the can of Coke study here in just a second, and then kind of wrap it up. But one thing that I found interesting was, you know, we have a lot of uh, people in our, in our, in our, in our matrix, right. In our ecosystem, in the free continuity group, we're going through one of our challenge uh, community groups, excuse me, the face fasting for life community group on Facebook mm-hmm. or our continuity group or our challenges that we run. And there's a lot of people that will say, you know, sign up and they say, Hey, I've decreased some of my blood, pre- uh, blood pressure and diabetes medications and all these things from putting fasting in. Yeah. But there's always this thing of like, Hey, I tracked my numbers and I started walking or I started working out. My numbers went up. So mm-hmm. this study actually showed that glucagon, the, the post-exercise glucagon, which is the one that tells your body to take that stored energy, right? That 20, 30 pounds of fat that we have on our body mm-hmm. or that glycogen in the, short, in the short-term stores in the liver and transfer it into glucose. So that means your body's actually, you ingest food, glucose goes up. Now you have more energy to burn. Glucagon in this study still went up, mm-hmm. but the, the actual outcome was that By doing the walking for 30 minutes, the glucose spike was still less, even though the glucagon reacted normally. So it wasn't just that 
you had a blunted or decreased glucose spike, right? Or you were counteracting the effect of that meal on your insulin. But it also showed that it lowered the insulin levels, which is the main problem when developing insulin resistance. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if, if we can, if we can keep those, those peaks from being quite as high, especially with something as easy to do as putting 30 minutes of, of walking or, or light exercise yeah. in after our meals uh, a few times yep. a week. I mean, that's, a, that's amazing. So I love this because there was another one that we picked up and it was funny because I, I sent it to you you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't love that one as much. Full transparency. You're like, nobody really drinks Coke as much as they used to. <laughs> and then, and you're right. They probably don't. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Coke even has like a Coke natural or something now. Right. So <laughs> you're either in the Coke or Pepsi family, or if you were in my economic status growing up, you were in the RC Cola family. If you don't know what that is, then that's fine. But um, this study was also in regards to looking at um, using walking um, uh, with or without a walk after you ingest a can of Coke and what that does to your blood sugar, right? Mm -hmm. So when the the cool thing about this was, uh, the eye-opening thing about this was that in 2014, they found that 63% between 2011 and 2014, nearly half of adults and 63, over, over half. Yeah. well, 50% of adults and 63% of people 19 and under. Ah, okay. So although consumption is still declining in some groups, I mean, that's still really stinking high, right? So sure, you and I were yeah. like, nah, we don't really want to talk about this. That's probably not Well, we might've just kind of been a little myopic living on our little bubble here, um, you know, where if I'm going to have something that has, um, you know, fizz to it, it's going to be a carbonated water or a craft IPA. So full transparency, (laughs) Coke is out of the picture for me. Sure. So the, the realization here was it wasn't about the Coke. It was about the amount of fructose that was used in these, in this study, it was 39 grams of carbs, right? Mm -hmm. So the naked juices, the, Mm -hmm. um, even like the store-bought, you know, cran apple juices, um, the apple juices, the Starbucks Frappuccino, sweetened tea, sweetened coffee. Right. So something that, so 36 grams of carbohydrates, like, so what's really cool is we're not even talking about food. We're simply talking about a drink, one drink. Right. Right. Yeah. So using the same concept of walking right after ingestion showed an incredible decrease in blood sugar immediately after ingestion. And this was one person saw nearly a hundred milligram per deciliter difference. That is a massive difference in ingesting the Coke and not going for a walk or ingesting the Frappuccino and not going for a walk or ingesting Mm -hmm. the store-bought whatever and not going for a walk compared to simply going out and walking periodically throughout the day. So this isn't just after a meal, but if you have a wider fasting window and you decide to get the Frappuccino or the matcha green tea or the whatever in the morning, Mm -hmm. and then you're going to have your lunch, you know, four hours later, if you, let's say you're doing a 24 fasting window, a 20, hour fast with a four hour eating slash feeding window. Yeah. You can simply do, you know, a a 20 to 30 minute walk after that, which is going to decrease the blood sugar spike. And then you're going to eat intentionally an hour later and then do another 30 minute walk. And you've just drastically reduced your insulin and blood sugar response. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing how great an effect, um, something so simple can have on this, but literally the body freaks out when we, when we bring in this much sugar at at one time. And because when we drink it, I mean, it, it immediately gets, gets, I mean, it doesn't even have to start processing within the body. It, It immediately starts getting absorbed. Um, it starts going into the bloodstream. So the, the insulin spike is way higher than, than it normally should be. Like, uh, if we take the same number of carbohydrates and we, we eat them in a meal, uh, with some protein and some fat, some vegetables, some fiber, the insulin spike is much, much, much lower, but the, the sugary drinks. And again, even the natural ones will cause a very large spike in the insulin. So anything that we can do to dull that 
effect is going to help keep our body um, from just immediately going into fat storage mode and then bringing on those feelings of lethargy, like, you know, tired, kind of worn out and just kind of just just not feeling great because it's 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 kind of freaking out about about this just extreme bolus of sugar um, that gets put in. Yeah. And it, it, the, the cool thing about this study was, you know, the, the idea of fructose versus glucose. So we're talking, you know, high fructose corn syrup, those, those artificial sweeteners that are put in stuff, you yeah. know, it's the Coke is 60% fructose. So if it was only 30% fructose, it would probably be a much less of a spike. Um, so really, you know, looking at the fructose component um, is important. And then just for the numbers to land the plane on this study was the median. So the average change of the, the blood sugar spike after either walking or not walking was 33% different, 33%. And, um, the, uh, the average peak was like 20%, right? So the change in the total spike versus just the highest point in the spike, anywhere between almost like 20 to 33%. So I'm, I'm an optimist. Let's shoot for that 33% number, right? You're talking maybe 30 to 40 points, 20 to 40 points on blood sugar. Now, so if you went into your doctor and said, hey, here are my numbers for the last month, and they were 40 points lower, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a big deal. That's like yeah. diabetic, pre-diabetic. You mm-hmm. can span from diabetic to pre-diabetic in 25 points, and then another 25 points, so just outside of this range, and now you're no longer pre-diabetic. So we're not far off from changing those, those metabolic uh, categories or those even di- medical diagnoses of like, do you have this condition or not? So mm-hmm. I just love that something so simple. I'm going to say it one more time for simplicity. Walking or moderate activity for just 30 minutes, three times a week, post ingestion of a drink like this that has 39 grams or a meal that you've intentionally eaten and planned post breaking a fasting window is absolutely incredibly powerful and so simple that I think like, I would have liked to have written this article because this is like the fasting for life mantra. Let's keep it simple and let's keep it effective and let's right. give back control. Absolutely. And you know, the the other point that hit home with me was I was a big calorie and macro tracker for a long time. So, you know, doing a little extra cardio so I could have some extra calories to fit in like later on in the day, or if I knew I was I was gonna, you know, have a date night or something like that. And, you know, when we when we talk about a can of Coke or, you know, a glass of fruit juice or something else like that, the number of calories is, is not very large. We could be talking about 150 calories here, which overall for the day, maybe less than 10% for most people, but the, the actual insulin and blood sugar spike are, are way, way overly disproportional to, to like a normal meal. So just the, the effect on the body and then, and then the control that we can have, um, it's just, it's, it's eye opening. And so, you know, that, that's why we're going to encourage you for an action step today, just yep. to, to, to get a little bit more active after the insulin spikes, after you break your fast, get a little bit more active, put in deliberate um, action, you know, walking, uh, light cardio, whatever it is that, that you feel comfortable doing, put that in after you break your fast so that, you know, you're having even greater levels of control over the blood sugar and over the insulin spike. And if you want to go to the next step and put fasting into your day-to-day life, go to the fastingforlife.com, download the fast start guide, and that'll help you put six steps into your day-to-day life to get started there too. Yep. Fantastic. If you guys are looking for some additional support, a place of like-minded people that all we do is talk about this type of stuff, (laughs) <laughs> uh, head over to Facebook um, and search for the Fasting for Life community. The group is growing so much positive energy and encouragement. People just yeah. starting more extended fast, start people just starting, people who've left fasting and come back. It's a really cool place of encouragement, accountability, support, and of like-minded individuals. So Tommy, with that, you landed the plane beautifully. Get moving three times a week, 30 minutes at a time. You fell off the wagon. You had a whoopsie. Whoops. Shouldn't have had that. Go walk, go walk for 30 minutes. You've just actually done something positive where your brain goes, Oh, you know what? I kind of like this and your blood sugar. Thanks you too. So thank you, sir. Great, great conversation today. Um, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. So you've heard today's episode and you may be wondering where do I start? Head on over to the fastingforlife.com. 
and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive fasting tips and strategies to maximize results and fit fasting into your day-to-day life. While you're there, download your free Fast Start Guide to get started today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Fasting for Life.